Welcome everyone to today's webinar. We will be covering the topic on how to effectively implement an environment and monitoring system. This is a two-part webinar which we hope you'll find informative and a good reference for anybody considering implementing a monitoring system or an expansion of a current system. My name is Jason Kelly. I am the Vice President of Services here at Lighthouse Worldwide Solutions. My experience spans worldwide managing of monitoring system and projects and managing teams and services that support monitoring systems. Before we get into today's presentation, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in at any time and I will address them and we will also be looking at some common questions at the end of this presentation. So let's jump into it. What is an EMS, FMS, or PMS? Uh, an EMS, or Environmental Monitoring System, monitors critical locations in a clean room. An EMS has multiple types of environmental sensors from particle counters, air sampling devices, temperature, humidity, or pressure sensors, to name a few. Real-time data is collected from the EMS, and the EMS acts as an early detection system if environmental conditions stray from their nominal settings. This early detection can assist in determining if there is contamination present in the environment that may impact on the product safety and quality. An EMS is a watchdog for early system failures and EMS data is used to support product releases. We're such a crucial tool in making sure the sterile environments are sterile, especially during product manufacturing, it is really important to understand that implementing an EMS is a major strategic decision in product safety. Therefore, let's take a tutorial on how to effectively implement an EMS that works for you and not against you. And I said, that if you hear a PMS or FMS, they're kind of the same thing, except in my experience, the PMS only consists of particle counters, hence the name particle monitoring system. A FMS is a facility monitoring system and can be construed as a PMS or EMS or a combined system. Just want to clarify to you some of the three letter acronyms floating around in case any of you are unaware. So let's dive into this. The best place to start, in my opinion, on this journey we're about to undertake is right from the beginning. One of the biggest hurdles to overcome is the procurement process itself. Sometimes a customer seeking an EMS solution is overwhelmed by the task and is needing much support to understand the flow of implementation of an EMS. The project procurement stages at the beginning of the project are critical and the customer needs to understand that this process is something that requires experienced people to implement, whether it's an internal team with that experience or a combination of customer vendor customer consultant and vendor, an internal team. The whole process is it's, it's something that cannot be done overnight. And there are several discovery stages involved before a purchase order is issued. The task of gathering the information can be daunting, especially if the customer does not have experience in what an EMS is and what even to monitor. One of the main issues is that the EMS touches many departments such as production, IT, quality, micro to name a few. So it is important in the planning stages that all internal departments that use an SM, that will be using an EMS are all involved in the planning as well as the implementation stages. I can't stress this enough. In my early days as a young EMS project manager, I had many a heated moment with IT departments who refused to come to the party as they did not want an unknown entity on their network. Uh, by nature, IT departments do not like changes to the network. So it's really crucial that these guys are part of the planning process and understand what is required. A risk mitigation exercise should be undertaken. For those of you not familiar with risk mitigation, we have a great information on this topic. In the fact, Hashim Salmaz, who regularly hosts our webinars, is a bit of an expert of uh, risk mit mitigation as well as an expert in the contamination control industry. He's got a great article published on this and you can find it on our website under the Knowledge Center. Here is the location where you can find that paper. It's a great resource of information. Our website is www.golighthouse.com. We also offer risk assessment templates and we do have specialists that can go over the requirements when needed. In fact, you'll find a lot of great resources 
on the Knowledge Center, which will help you understand many aspects of contamination control. So I encourage you all to check it out. There are many interesting topics covered here. Here we have a sneaky peeky of some content. Hashim has also done some great webinars on this topic, so he's a bit of a guru. And I can also be of service on this too, if you're more local. And knowledge is power and sharing off and the sharing of an EMS project with a firm understanding of risk and how to design your URS, your user requirement specification, using the risk assessment is only a recipe for success in my mind when implementing an EMS system. So with the planning process and for the customer before they make a decision, gathering the information from EMS vendors is critical. Here at Lighthouse, we have a system where we help the customer define the solution for their EMS. We use a document and a process of user requirement questionnaire, the URQ, which is not to be confused with the URS or user requirement specification. The URQ is simply our way of helping our customers define the EMS. And it also helps us to specify what the EMS design should be for each customer. In the URQ, there are multiple questions asked, such as type of manufacturing facility, is it built? Are we talking about a greenfield site? What products are made? What type of industry? Details about the facility? What type of monitoring is required? Does the customer prefer to use a vacuum system or should the part accountants have internal vacuum? Does the pressure monitoring require a cascade or if a central differential pressure monitoring cabinet is required? Such questions help us define the EMS proposal. Our team can also help customers who simply do not know what they want um, which happens uh, so uh, quite a bit. And, and we like to lock in and specify in great detail what the customer EMS is going to entail. Now, for those customers who do understand EMS systems, they typically present us with a URS, a user requirement specification. I really love it when customers have done this groundwork and understand what they need. Typically, an external consultant is used, and in some cases, the internal knowledge is there and the experience is in-house. So when we get a URS, we diligently go through it, and we have a response mechanism called a URS traceability matrix, which is our way of responding to the URS with a confirmation of what we can and cannot deliver in the URS. I've never seen a URS supplied to me or to, to our company where we are completely 100% in terms of what we can deliver. And in that case, we do offer alternatives. But at the end of the day, you need to understand how we're going to meet the requirements and be transparent about it. You know, the key is being transparent and shown with examples how you can meet these requirements using an alternative methods and still get the same result. So with a URQ combined with a URS, we are already moving in the right direction to a smooth process where success is inevitable. Um, section 4.5 is just my little bit of humor, you know, but you definitely don't want to have, you know, issues where connections to outside software, stuff like Facebook and Twitter installed on your system. That's a recipe for disaster and productivity, I, I, I would expect. So let's look at the four stages of a project, you know, the EMS project management process. So let's move on quickly and say, let's, let's say the customer has selected the vendor and a PO is placed. The next stage is to initiate the project. It is critical that the project is managed by a competent and experienced project manager. Here we have project managers who manage the product centrally. Once a PO is received, the project has an initiation stage with a kickoff meeting. Then the next phase would focus on the planning and system design. And then uh, we have the execution and the monitoring and control and finally the closing off. These are just a brief outline of the project. Let's get into the four stages of a project. Starting the project, this stage involves gathering, evaluating, and framing the business need for the project and the general approach to performing it and agreeing to prepare a prepared detailed project plan. Outputs from the stage may include approval to proceed to the next stage, documentation, the need for the project, and rough estimates of time and resources to perform. And it often include uh, a project charter and the scheduling and an initial list of people who may be interested in involved or affected by the project. Stage two involves developing a plan that specifies the desired results, the work to do, the time, the cost, 
the other resources required, and a plan of how to address key project risks. Outputs from the stage may include a project plan documenting in intended project results and the time, resources, and supporting processes to help create them. Here we have got an example of a EMS project management Gantt chart of the project plan. The Gantt charts are used and each aspect of the various stages and timelines should be reviewed. The draft commissioning and validation documents should be issued. It's, it is critical uh, that there's sufficient time for review and sign off. Having all your ducks lined up will help you move into the installation stages more smoothly. Let's look at stage three. The on-site team should be established and a site project manager selected to lead the installation, commissioning and validation activities on site. And um, it's very critical that you do move in conjunction with your project plan. And you know some outputs may include project results, the project progress reports and other communications, weekly meetings, for example, to get the achievement uh, we, we all desire of the installation and the commissioning and validation. And, we then move on to the closeout of the project. The handover and closing stage is really important and business continuity should be priority. How many projects I've, like how many projects I've managed where penny pinching occurred and the user did not put enough in the budget to maintain business continuity? For example, investing in remote support, service level agreements, spare parts and training. Would you believe sometimes we have customers who have staff leave and end up with no EMS manager to the point that they can't even log into their own system? It happens, so it's really important to close out the project with business continuity in mind as, mo as the most important aspect. Training is critical and retraining schedules are important, especially with new staff coming and all start staff leaving. It really is crucial to have that uh, information or have that built into the project with change control, for example. So now that we have a brief outline of the URQ, URS, and an overview of how to manage the project, let's take a deeper dive and jump back into the procurement stages. And I find that it is crucial to gather the right information as each EMS is unique. And as they say, the devil is in the detail. So you could have a situation where the facility is not even built, as I mentioned earlier, or the facility is under construction. That's fine. In fact, it's the best time to be involved with the project in these early stages rather than come on, on board when the facility is built, now that's kind of like my worst nightmare, to be honest, coming in at those later stages and trying to catch up with everybody else. It's really important that the customer does the research. I can't stress that enough. Ask your boss to provide a budget and the research team. Leaving such an important project on the shoulders of one person is not the way to go about this. The EMS should be clearly defined and the team should be fully aware of the strengths and weaknesses of each vendors offering. I would recommend to compare several vendors and come up with a shortlist based on a risk assessment. You know your process and you can also get external assistance in developing the risk assessment. Does the EMS comply to the latest regulations? What sort of support is support provided? Is there after error support? Is the system easily upgraded? Does the system have redundancy and appropriate data backups? Can the sensors be calibrated? Does the vendor offer site calibrations and services, and so on and so forth. These questions should be asked. In fact, let's look at some of the questions that really need to be asked when you're looking at an EMS system. Uh, let's look at networking. You know, Where will the end user want to see the EMS data? That's an important question. Will the monitoring system be a closed system, i.e. not operating on the end user's local area network? Will the EMS data need to be viewed and archived across the end user's LAN? Can the monitoring system be a closed system and operate across the end user's land at the same time? Do you need cooperation from the end user's IT department? Can you install sensors on the end user's land? If so, what are the risks? Can you install EMS clients on the end user's land? Looking at data storage and backup, what are the end user's needs or policies regarding data storage and backup or archiving? Referring to 21 c 411 section 11 and looking at closed systems, validation, et cetera, business continuity. How do you configure a mirror database and where is the best place to put it? How do I implement a database with multiple EMS clients and redundant clients? Looking at operating system platforms, can I run and monitor on a virtual server? What operating systems are supported? Redundant systems. What is the end user's appetite for risk? Is there real time hot standby monitoring needed? What is the best way to implement a redundant monitoring system? 
Is there a site UPS available? What does the customer want connected to it? Data IO redundancy, where are all the power supplies, modules, and data backed up by the UPS? The vacuum system used to UPS. Is there a reasonable investment considering the nature of potential loss and the administration of redundant power? Will production hall, for example? Is there a triage of where the power gets sent to from the, the backup system, the emergency generator? How much redundancy does the customer need and is it practical? All these questions need to be asked. Looking at EMS data, is the data 21 to 411 compliant? How is the data integrity managed? If we look at the sensors, how many remote part counters can I connect to the system network? How do I integrate remote part counters into the system network? How do I integrate environmental sensors into the system network? What is the best way to connect alarm beacons into the system network? What is the max number of sample points or sensors supported by the monitoring client and the software in general? What is the minimum sample interview? The shorter the interval, the more data will be generated. Looking at alarms, how will the end user immediately inform their operators when an action or alert limit is breached? Will the end user develop a specific SOP to follow for CGMP purposes? Is it important to see the monitoring system data in critical areas via local alarm panel displays? Do alarms need to be remotely accessible, SMS, text, or emails? For remote access, does the end user need to access the data from home or off-site? What is the best way to view monitor remotely? Will the, an EMS client run on a virtual private network? Can I view data from a monitor or client on an iPad or iPhone? At the end of the day, it's all about the data. So I wanted to give a clear understanding of the types of questions as there are solutions out there. I tried not to get too commercial, but with the 27 years of working in this industry and experience that comes with all of that. And I've worked for most EMS vendors all over the world, so I know what is out there. I really want to educate you to understand what to look for. The vendor is important. Their service support, hardware, and software are all important. So let's look at a quick video to illustrate what a system can be capable of. And data in integrity really is fundamental to all of our EMS system designs. And that drives our new technology as well. So let's get the popcorn out. This will be a few, take a few minutes. And I will be back with some more details on system networks right after this. In cleanroom environments, many factors can put your products at risk. Real-time cleanroom monitoring is designed to ensure compliance and provide risk mitigation. The integrity of your cleanroom data, its availability, and the environmental compatibility of the monitoring system itself are the deciding factors for the success of your monitoring system. The Apex family of real-time remote particle counters are the culmination of Lighthouse's three decades of cleanroom monitoring experience. The Apex instruments are designed to meet these needs and enhance your cleanroom operations. Apex remote particle counters have best-in-class sensor performance thanks to improved resolution. The Apex instruments include Lighthouse's industry-leading self-diagnostics to ensure the accuracy of your data. The technology continuously monitors and records the instrument's health in order to provide immediate notification related to any potential out-of-spec condition. These features help minimize production-associated risks to your products. With Lighthouse's Smart Bracket accessory, you will have peace of mind knowing that your data is coming from the correct location. With the Smart Bracket, Apex Remote Particle Counters can be swapped quickly and without making changes in the software. Plug and Play technology reduces operator error and simplifies sensor location management. With Lighthouse's LMS software, your data is secure thanks to features like redundant server configurations, custom password protected users, and secure databases. Apex Remote Particle Counters have a 3000 data record buffer built in so that in the event of a communication loss with the system, the instrument continues recording data. The Apex Remote Particle Counter family meets and exceeds ISO 215014 standards. Having readily available access to your cleanroom data is crucial to ongoing operations. Through Lighthouse's monitoring system, your cleanroom data is clearly viewable and includes easy to understand icons that alert you in real time. With Lighthouse's cleanroom monitoring software, you can access your data from computer, tablet, or smartphone. This system can provide optional alerts to your email or cell phone. In addition to being coupled with system alarm lights within your clean room, Apex Remote Particle Counters have an optional LCD display to make viewing particle counts at their source hassle-free. A built-in smart port adds to the Apex's flexibility, 
allowing for compatible accessories to be plugged directly into the unit. To keep your clean room running smoothly, Lighthouse designed the Apex Remote Particle Counter family to work with you, not against you. Constructed from 304 grade stainless steel and custom formulated polycarbonate, the Apex Remote is designed to be compatible within your clean room environment. When paired with an optional shrouded smart bracket, Apex Remote Particle Counters are wipe downable and wash downable with VHP procedures. In order to best fit your facility's infrastructure, Apex Remote Particle Counters are available in both Ethernet and serial versions. These particle counters go where you need them, even when there's no vacuum available. Thanks to the Apex Remote with Pump, all you need is power and data access. The pump's exhaust is HEPA filtered to maintain your clean environment. With the quality and reliability that comes with Lighthouse Worldwide Solutions three decades of experience, the Apex Remote Particle Counters will take your clean room operation to the next level. So types of EMS networks. This system, the standalone system, uh, would have vacuum redundancy, and it's commonly used for small to medium-sized monitoring systems. This system can also be further enhanced with particle counters with internal vacuum, having a spare sensor as a backup. So um, the end user's LAN is not used. Like we have a connection here that is really just standalone. And um, by having a standalone network, the monitoring system is on its own network, is less of a risk for the customer IT to support, and is more secure and a simplistic form of a monitoring system network. But you do have some trade-offs in terms of clients management and the remote access, et cetera, et cetera. Distributed network, these networks enable more features and, and functionality as well as connectivity. I would say they are probably the most common types of systems we sell today into the pharma industry and other industries as well, particularly as we start to see our work lifestyles go more remote as well. The, the, the connectivity aspect is, is very, very good and uh, looking at virtual servers as well. Uh, distribu distributed networks are used where the customer core more features and functionality other than a monitoring system. Complex distributed systems, well, well, what can I say? They're complex and very difficult to maintain, validate, and validate. You could have a wireless, multiple LANs, and even networks which run over long distances, and the system is dependent on network providers. So we have data. We could have data latency issues going on there. And uh, there could be high instances of data losses with these systems. And, and, you know, in my experience, we have seen issues that take a lot of time to overcome. And I do question such systems and I can conclude that they do not work for you really. And I question the benefits, the overall benefits of these complex distributed networks. A good risk assessment should look at the impact of such complex systems versus the rewards. I tend to steer customers to one of the other two systems we just looked at. Uh, they're far, far more easier to install and far more reliable. And let's get into some installations. Uh, and as I've mentioned, I have spent a long time managing systems integrations worldwide. So. Let's have a look at some installations and I have, I can add some of my advice and experience to some of these uh, installations I've worked on over the years. So this is a site in Sydney, Australia, which was in its early stages when I was managing the project. As you can see, there really is no facilities. Therefore, facility drawings are so important and they are crucial into the planning of the EMS installation. It is also good to be involved with the project at this stage and to also get to know the other key players who are contracted on site, as you will all be running cables and some tubing and electrical and all sorts on site. And um, you'll all be fighting for those wall channel spaces and ceiling spaces, and it can become crowded. So updating the drawings and mapping out locations, et cetera, can become di difficult unless you are in early in order to avoid conflicts. And again, the devil's in the detail. Looking at these drawings, here's an example of, of that facility, and you've got details of the, the locations. We have a legend here. I'll just like make it expand there a bit so you can see a bit more detail. Apologies if it's still blurry, but it's really important to um, understand where everything is going. Like, so this example will have sensor locations color coded and marked out, and it's really important to have all your ducts lined up and to have all the drawings marked up and approved. Drawings should be as detailed as possible, right down to the heights of the wall plates and sensors. The risk assessment should also detail this information. If you want more information on risk assessments, you can visit our knowledge center, as explained, on our website, 
where you can download a great guideline by Hashim Samaz. I do recommend his publications if you are new to risk assessments. So remember, once the physical installation takes place, it becomes costly to change. So putting a good amount of focus on locking in cable tubing runs and final, final sensor locations is key. And this all should be signed off in stage three of the project phase. During the project kickoff meeting and subsequent weekly or bi-weekly meetings, it should be addressed in the plan outlined. And all stakeholders should sign off the drawings and be aware. So if we have everything locked in. Uh, well, the EMS facility walk down, that's again, in, at this stage, resilience is on drawings. It's important as you orientate yourself in the facility and you find your compass, especially when there are no reference points and the site is sent to you a, black a blank canvas. However, once you get your bearings, a can of spray paint can be used to mark out on the concrete floor or the ceiling above exactly where your locations are going. And uh, that will help guide the, the cable and tubing runs. A good experienced project manager will know what he or, see, or she is using. Um, and out of this chaos, the magic starts to happen. And the drawings, again, are really critical to make this happen. Let's look at some construction types and some walls that you may encounter. It's important that you understand how these different types are constructed. So you can plan out the cable and tubing runs and the wall plate locations. You can plan out where your IO cabinets are going to go, your servers, et cetera. I would also encourage a sound understanding of HVAC systems as knowing where air enters and leaves each room is important. A astute customer will have carried out a risk assessment and already have the sensor final locations marked out in the risk assessment documentation. We also provide these risk assessments and, tip, and, are, and are typically carried out prior to the user requirement specification, and they actually map out the URS. With this structure on the side of the wall, you can go up and the cables tube and can still be run. Like the wall, one side of the wall here can go up, and on the other side, you can still run the cables and tubing. These type of walls are really used in lower grade environments. So, you, you know, even though one side of the wall may go up, you can still get your access on the other side of the wall. So again, as we move on to the likes of sandwich panels, uh, you know, they have recessed channels between each panel, which allows for the cabin and tubing to run down these channels. There's limited space, so early planning is essential. Again, another reason for facil facility drawings and locations are important and to have them locked in. As you can see, as the construction goes here, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's points of the, of the construction where it's difficult to go back. So the planning really, really is important. Here we see a uh, ceiling location with, with a ring vacuum. This is the ring vacuum here for remote particle counters and air samplers that will pull, pull the vacuum from a centralized vacuum system. You see here, this is a vacuum line that's tapped off from the ring vacuum. We've also got a deep pre lines here, which are separate to the ring vacuum. These are for differential pressure sensors. And we have some ethernet connections for other sensors that will also pair up and communicate with particle counters or temperature humidity sensors, DP sensors. In this particular project, we decided to color code the ethernet connection. So we knew straight away which, um, color was for which particular particle counter or, or T or H sensor or DP sensor. Here we have the walls installed. This is the same picture, but you can start to see now as the, as the facility gets built up, the walls are up. You can also see that the, the crawl space, uh, you know, let me just grab my little laser pen. Here we go. This area here, you know, if you haven't had all, you know, everything run and, and put in beforehand, imagine trying to call, crawl around your belly and do all that work. So, you know, there needs to be a proper process in place so that you're not backtracking and causing more chaos and havoc within the facility and, up and delaying the process. So this requires coordination with other trades who are also installing like the walls so you can work in tangent with them and keep the momentum going and not cause delays on site. So it's so important that the project manager is on top of this process. And again, communication is key. The workers that are working during the day or, or if it's over weekends, and I need to have that direct communication going back to the project manager. So this, the schedules are, are really um, upheld and that no delays are, 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 are you know, considered core at all. It's really important to keep the momentum going. So here's another example of a different type of build. And we have um, the outside external area where it is walkable space and we're using cable trays. And again, this is much better than the previous example because you can walk on the roof of the clean room and it's easier to run your cable, tubing, whatever. And you can see here, everything's nice and neatly run. The other example, we had to kind of uh, hang them from the ceiling, the concrete ceiling. 
Furthermore, we have another example here, which had a kind of a mixture of walkable area and places yet you couldn't walk on. So that wasn't as easy. So these are just different variations of types of uh, problems that you, you can encounter in, the, in the, the build of the clean room, depending on the type of build. So it's really important to understand uh, the type of build and to work with other, other vendors and get all that information in, in, in meetings so that you, you got no surprises as you go to do the installation that could cause delays. So sensor installation, let's look at some examples of sensor installations. In this example, we have a particle counter with a smart bracket that's being installed. And this is where you have, let me grab my laser, that you have the vacuum line here for the, the sample that will, will pull the vacuum through the sensor. And we have our ethernet cable that will power the unit and also it will um, communicate with the software and the monitoring system software. So you can see here we have these smart brackets and then as we move further along, the part of the counter will get connected nice and neatly. And at the end, you have a nice secure um, part of counter in a nice bracket that's easily removed. And you have the design here, a nice sloping for when there's no particle traps. These tubing and cable isn't dangling underneath. So easily wiped downable. In fact, these part of the counters have a great IP rating. We've, we've got videos of these in a share with a full blast and they still manage to keep nice and dry inside. I know we have experience of some customers thinking they're liquid particle counters and really soaking them, mopping them down, which we don't recommend. But uh, if you do want to have a look later, or if you're considering these type of models, you, you would definitely can send some videos of them in a shower, still running and working, of course. If we look at some other sensors, we, here we have an example of a differential pressure sensor mounted. We can see in this example, the DP sensor is fully enclosed in a sealed enclosure for easy wipe down and visibility as well, you can still see on the display. Um, you can see as well, detailed wiring diagrams that also insist in the installations and also enable the customer have a good wiring documents to troubleshoot later on if needed. And then as you can, as you can see, the sensor is easy, easily removable for services and calibrations. And then, you know, at Lighthouse, we empower our customers so they have the ability to look after the systems. So we can go into that approach in part two next month we'll definitely go into more detail of the commissioning and validations and the PQ and the training stages of environmental monitoring system. Another example here is a TRH sensor. Same sort of uh, setup again with the nice wiring diagrams and the, the wipe downable enclosure. So um, these are just some examples of the, the sensors. And again, when you're looking at other vendors, you need to just compare stuff like this and make sure they're products are really compatible and easy uh, to, to install for, for your application. So let's do a, a recap. Um, so, so far we've, we've covered the procurement stages, the importance in risk assessments using the user requirement questionnaire, the EMS project management process, what to ask when implementing an EMS, the types of EMS networks, the importance of EMS drawings, the EMS walk downs, the types of constructions, running of tubing and cables and sensor installation. So we've gone through quite a bit already. Uh, and then let's have a look at some common questions as we near the end of this presentation. So question one, what is a URS traceability matrix? I did mention this earlier before when we do get a URS from the customer, a traceability matrix is our way of ensuring that all aspects of the customer URS have been reviewed and we outline how we're going to meet the requirements of the customer URS. The matrix has a percentage calculation of what we can meet. And if there are any US requirements we cannot meet directly, we, we show how we can indirectly meet those requirements. And you know, we also have lots of nice links in the your in the traceability matrix where you can click on specifications, look at videos of the product, further information about the, the some of our customer feedback, technical papers. Um, looking at some of the software solutions when these sensors connect up to to the this, the monitoring software, for example. So it's a comprehensive feedback to the customer on their URS and how we're also going to meet their requirements and not just saying yes, we can do it. We show you how we can do it. So there's that also that layer of oh, okay, these guys are really you know good at what they do. They're really showing us exactly how they're going to meet the requirement, and that gives an overall good feeling for the start of the project with the customer. Let's look at question two. How much of an impact does a risk assessment have on the user requirements development? So 
I would advise that the risk assessment is the driving force in the development of the URS. And I would recommend that a risk assessment is used. You know, the risk assessment will outline the need for the monitoring, assist, the monitoring system. It will outline what types of sensors and where, you know, you should put them. And it really is a comprehensive system of, of um, sh showing the, the customer, the end user, you know, the, the, the mitigation. And I would also recommend to have a summary of your risk assessment and risk, risk mitigation. For example, you know, talk about part of counters that would be used, the types of models justify, you know, vacuum or, or internal vacuum. Uh, look at, well, if I do choose a vacuum system, what about loss of vacuum? vacuum do I have a redundancy built in? Or what about um, contingency, like later on? What, what about recommended spare parts? How do we keep the system running if there's a problem with a sensor or a module, et cetera? Another thing to focus on is looking at the uh, locations. You should clearly map, map out where the um, locations of the sensors are. Get your facility drawn so there's no ambiguity you know, when the project kicks off as to where everything's going to go. And again, these things can be changed as the project moves forward and, uh, you know, there's a better understanding of, 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 of the, the facility and, and how the impact would be of the sensors in particular locations. Yeah, following the GAMP guidelines, for example, um, outlining how we're going to apply GAMP, uh, what sort of category is our software, you know, uh, let's look at the network. Which network are we providing? Let's give, a, an, a, you know, during the risk assessment, an overview of the, um, the software requirements. So there's a lot involved, a lot to digest, but really, you know, focus on this risk assessment because it will help with outlining your URS. And by following these processes, you will get a strong URS, which will lead to a strong environmental monitoring system working for you and not against you. And having all of the key people involved in development of this within your company, all the different departments is really the way to go. You know, I'm seeing like, you know, a lot more effort and energy being put into these types of projects now. 10 years ago, you know, some, some companies would just hand over to one person and it's all on their shoulders and there's not a lot of knowledge and they're relying a lot on what the vendor would tell them and, and other external consultants. But it's really important to have the knowledge built in-house. Uh, particularly of a project of this size and impact on the business, you know, monitoring systems are very critical, and then especially the data coming from those those, those uh, monitoring systems. Question number three: Should sensor cables tubing be concealed? Well, like as you saw in the, the example, absolutely. I'd recommend that in certain locations of the cream, you know, the cables and tubing should be concealed, uh, and and you know it's very prudent to have this built in and. That way, you know, you're able to do your clean downs a lot easier and still, you know, obviously protect the sensors themselves as well. So yeah, it's very important that the sensors should be concealed. So we're just about to the end of this presentation and this webinar. Um, you know, in next, next month's webinar, part two, uh, we're gonna be going and looking at the EMS validation and system handover. And, you know, again, any questions you have, you can email me, there's my email here. And, uh, you know, looking at, sorry, let me just go back in case you need a bit more time to, to take it. It's basically jasonk at golighthouse.com. And then next month, we will start looking at the, um, the EMS validation and the system handover. Really, really critical parts uh, of the project. So thank you for your time today. Um, I really appreciate your feedback and, and some more questions that I can address later on. I will get back to your questions relatively fast. In the meantime, um, stay safe out there and remember to keep uh, an eye on our, our invites for next month. You should get them in your inbox or you can find them on our website and sign up for our knowledge center. We do have a lot of good information there. You can sign up and you'll be surprised, you know, a lot of stuff that we're providing out there. It's really a library of information. So stay safe and uh, have a good rest of your day or night or whatever time zone we're in here at the moment. And uh, we'll catch up next month for part two. Take care.